Well, it wouldn't be a Nathan video without you doing something stupid. So apart from the fact your coat's flopping all over like a superhero. Um, yeah, okay, so let's have a look at it. Short turns. I would imagine, obviously, I hadn't had that much getting used to the snow and stuff like that as well. But first things to point out is I, I hope that you've watched the Bite Size series on YouTube and my analysis series as well because... Clearly, you can see some of the things that I've spoke about anyway with um, other students, especially at this point here. What we have here is your leg is extremely straight up and down. So what that means is your hips have to go very far inside this stage, which is basically the end of the turn because you're about to pole plant. So that makes it extremely difficult for you to move all that mass across into the new turn. And because they're short turns with a fast impulse, it, it creates a stopping action and a pushing action, which is what's happening here. So the videos where I spoke about subtalar joint, which is a joint in the ankle, basically this is a good example of inactive subtalar joint where the ski's actually been flattened off and the knee's going the wrong way. It's actually supinating at this stage when it should be dropping more inside. So this is an extreme then hip angulation. And if you have extreme hip angulation in a short turn, it's going to make it very difficult for you to take the short turns to the next level. And in fact, what you're actually doing here is you're hinging the turn. So we can now see it. It's a hinge movement, which is what I mean by that is if you think of a, a squat movement and then a deadlift being a hinge movement, basically you're hinging from here. So you're using, overusing, and this is why it looks like when you watch the video, it looks like your, your hips are moving all over the place. And it's really because actually your upper body's all over the place. So if we come back to this point here, again, you'll see what I'm on about. There's no knee angulation, and I'll show you what that is with another video from somebody else skiing. And you can see what you've done is you've, to finish your turn, you're pushing. You're pushing yourself back uphill here when really, you should be toppling and falling into the new turn at this stage. And you've now blocked yourself with this leg. This leg's a block in preventing everything from moving in this direction. So that's quite a lot of information, but let's relate it into looking at like skiers, skiing it in a better thing. Um, this is me skiing a short turn. It's not very good quality but maybe we'll get an idea of what I'm talking about. Um, when I'm doing this short turn here, what you'll see is as I come round is here, this is where you talk about knee angulation. So there's an angle at the knee. So if you think you were straight with this leg, because I'm much more flexed, lower than you are, and my body's much more upright, it means that I'm using this more and what you're doing is you're just hinging from here more and you can see how much edge tilt there is now. This critical edge angle is much easier for me at this point in the turn. You can also see how at this point in the turn when I'm planting the pole, I'm allowing the mass to come in this direction. So I actually led the turn a bit with my upper body. I've sort of fallen into the new turn as opposed to my upper body being stuck behind my hips. And there's the knee angulation again. If I don't have knee angulation, what happens is, is without knee angulation, I end up being much more inside the turn so my body is much more inside the turn which creates this rocking action and makes it look like you're 
you're falling all over the place. Um, look at somebody even more dynamic. Let's have a look. We've got something here. Yeah, look at Gary on a short turn, actually. Oh, Franz short turn, Gary. Let's have a look. Gary on a short turn here. Yeah, this will do. So when I watch here, it's, it's a shame that, by the way, when you send us a video, it would be better if the video was straight on like this because when it's not straight on, it's sometimes difficult to see the symmetry. But if you see again, you'll see knee angulation. So you'll see what I'm talking about here. Okay. And if you remember, your leg on your video is straight. So if we'll just put you up alongside here. So we look at your turn here. So we're both turning onto the left here. So what you'll see is as you turn there, that's where your action is. You can see this straight leg. As he turns, you can see how much knee angulation he has created. In fact, from his knees up over, he's basically straight. He's in a straight line from his knees up over. Okay, so there's the angulation and then he's just straight up. Whereas you have the opposite. Your angulation is actually created here. And in a short turn, that doesn't work. That's a long turn. So this would really be the position you might be looking at in a long turn. Um, and you can see it. what it does. It creates a very um, flattening ski. Because you've got no knee angulation, you're constantly, your knee's constantly pushing the ski flat. And because you feel that, you'll feel like almost like a lack of grip, what it'll make you do at the end of the turn is push. And what you don't want to be doing is pushing. You make, at one point in the, the turns, you make a good turn back here somewhere, where I actually see you release the turn properly. There it is. Um, so at this point here, you actually make a relatively good release of the turn and I see the skis actually react how they should react. And they come off the ground because of the fact that in this turn here there is knee angulation, there is edge grip and you use what we would call an eccentric movement pattern. Now, what I mean by eccentric movement pattern, if you look at how Gary finishes his turns, you see the same thing with the skis off the ground. This lengthening procedure here is where he's lengthened his outside leg and he's about to engage. So through this bit here is going to be the engagement of his outside ski. Now, when he gets and feels that pressure, what he does is he doesn't do what you do, which is push against the pressure. Instead, he allows that pressure to build up, but he balances it by actually pulling his legs up over. And this is an eccentric movement as opposed to what you're doing, which is concentric. So if you think in a squat, when you stand up and you're lifting the weight in a squat, that's a concentric movement. But actually when you're lowering yourself towards the ground, that's an eccentric movement. Now, what Gary does is he retracts the legs there. What you do is you come round and you push the legs. So if we look lower down, because they were your good terms, when you start getting excited here, what you now do is you go up as you push, push, and you end up traveling up and over, which is a very basic method. So here, when we look at this one here, the legs extremely long and braced. Look at how much flexion there was here at the same point compared with your position. Note how his upper body is straight. And I've already said how your upper body's hinged. Okay, you need to learn to, it sounds ridiculous, but you need to learn more about the video where I talk about fore and aft balance, how to ski on the back, how to get back weight onto the heels more. Um, of course, in the Austrian system, they spend all the time trying to get you to go forward, and this is the result of it when it's mistimed. 
So his body's more upright. This gives him more access to pull his feet up. Okay, and then extend out, pull his feet up, and then extend out. Okay, so he remains relatively with a, quite a bit of an angle, whereas look at yours, okay? And this is a little bit down to the fact that I'm gathering, obviously you're traveling around and stuff, you won't be able to train very much. And I know some people go on about it and say, oh, it's not down to strength and mobility, agility, but it is. You do need a certain amount of ability to have strong legs when you want to ski how you want to ski. Um, you need the ability to, to feel this eccentric movement as well. So what you do, because you are probably, you know, a little bit more tired and not, not training as much, is you'll overuse this point here. It's like picking something up off the floor. You'll just bend from your waist and pick it up. You won't bend your ankle and knee and drop into a sitting position to, to pick something up because this is a lazy way of doing it. So at the minute, your skiing's would be described as a lazy method of skiing. You're just hinging instead of actually using all three of the potential joints and that would help massively. And they all have a knock-on effect. So it's very difficult to analyze somebody without just over complicating everything because there's a lot of things, you know, positive things going on in your skiing. Um, but equally, there's a lot of things that need changed. And my first concern if I was skiing with you would be the lack of ability to engage the edges um, because this is not critical edge angle. Again, you need to look at my videos where I discuss critical edge angle, whereas both Gary and I, when you saw my, you could, because my edges were yellow, you could clearly see how much difference I had. But you can now see the engagement at the tip here and you can see huge amounts of uh, edge tilt here, but what you'll notice what happens next, if I'm right, is he'll start to move heel heavy. He'll move to the back seat, bump. And it's that ability to move to the back seat, as you know, you've been told not to do for years, that you actually need to look at. It's this fore and aft that is so important in skiing because the vertical's gonna throw you out and disconnect you. So as a result, um, your movement is a, just a totally different pattern at the minute because everything's mistimed, it's out of time. So you've got to stop, push hard here, push as hard as you can down. And then all the way it goes back over. So now it's difficult because you've got to take all that mass, which is actually, <laughs> this is the middle point, and all that mass there has to somehow get into the front seat to get pressure onto there, that's gonna take time and make you feel like you're out of grip. And you can see it. You can see the disengagement of the subtalar joint. This is in the ankle um, at this stage. You can see the skis remain flat at this stage. They're still flat as you start to drop into the turn, okay? Whereas if you look at Gary, by the time he's above the fall line, He's already got edge tilt, which is why I said to you, if I was skiing with you, I'd be looking at how to improve your ability to get edge tilt and how to change your understanding of that. And that, that is not forward. Hinging and pushing your body forward like that will always push your backside back. Maybe practicing skiing a little bit more vertical. Okay, I'm not saying I want you straight up and down and with a rigid back. I do want you to have a nice, you know, um, hollow position in your back, but not as extreme forward, but maybe a little bit more, just changing that angle a bit and then working on your ability to time your fore and aft movement at your feet will be, you know, one step that you can move forward. Um, yeah, so in conclusion, we um, know that we need to see you more flexed, and that means not lazy flexed. Being small, like you think you are now, 
okay, is different to being small but actually being small by using these two things. What you've done is used that. Okay, so I get what you're trying to do. You're trying to be more dynamic. You're trying to be lower, but that's not lower. That's just you cheating the system. Okay, your body's found an easy way to do it. So first, start to feel what it's like with a more vertical upright posture, if you like. Just, just play with it. Play around with being a little bit more active in your ankle and knee as opposed to just hinging this forward. So like Gary is, he's more active in his ankle and knee. And this, look at this, this is typical example of being back onto the heel heavy. But it's timing when you do that. And that's the hard bit. That's why practicing it, because you have to then get onto the front on a slightly longer turn. So another suggestion for you will definitely be to um, open out that short turn. Stop trying to go tack, 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 tack. But instead, just make it, I don't know, you know, like a two and a half to three meter wide turn to give yourself a chance to practice this. Because at the minute, the other side effect is there's no deflection in your turn at the minute. Um, and that, what that means is you're not able to get your skis to, to deflect away from you. You end up more... On, on top of the skis. Um, where's Gary's turn again? Oh, oh whatever, my turn. Um, yeah, what we're trying to do is if you think from that position there, I want to get the skis away from me. And this is why sometimes I like the idea of when I go down in a ski, I see almost like an offset slalom course. So I, I think to myself, there's a red pole there and then there's a blue pole I have to go around. But it's not there. It's here. It's here. It's here. And that makes us deflect the skis. and makes us really push the skis um, laterally. Because this action that you're now, where I would go next after you've mastered the... <laughs> The edging part, the fore and aft and the vertical body, is I'd start talking about how the perception of falling and letting go is so important that you get the idea of, if you look at what I've done here, by the time I get this point, I'm already falling into the right turn. You see my body start to go, my head. Both of them, these bits here, have already fallen into the new turn. My feet are still on the track of the old turn, but they'll be pushed out. And then there's a deflection because I want to get that as far away from that as I possibly can as well. Anyway, if you've got any other questions, um, let us know. Otherwise, uh, join New Zealand.